Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again today. This is episode 3 of 3, a short series on the periodic table. We wanted to do a short one because we were reading about this and it was literally like blowing our minds. Not literally, but figured. Regardless, it was blowing our minds. So we talked a little bit about how the elements came to be, or at least how we discovered them. We talked about how Dmitry Mendeleev came up with the periodic table. And now we're going to talk a little bit about how the periodic table works, how it's organized, and how we add new things to it. So when you look at the periodic table, make sure you pull up one, okay? You can tell all the characteristics of an element just by looking at its position on the table. So horizontal rows, periods one through seven. The same period has the same number of atomic orbitals, essentially where the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus. So you've got one orbital in the first row, you've got two orbitals in the second row, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's also vertical columns along the periodic table. Those are groups 1 through 18, and the same group have same chemical and physical properties. So the noble gases on the far right don't react with anything. They're very inert. And then on the left, all the way on the left, we've got the alkali metals, which are super reactive, and they usually carry a plus one charge, and they react vigorously with water, and you know hydrogen's up there, and it just explodes if it can, no matter what. It's crazy. And each family has a name, but they are also grouped into those families so that they all share properties. Even if we don't have an element to fill in the space, we know what the element will do because of how this all fits together. And Mendeleev recognized that, even though he couldn't fill in the table, and we haven't even filled it all the way in. And he was, remember, in the 1860s. So just a quick glance at the periodic table, just to illustrate its perfection, you can see the element, whether or not it conducts electricity, whether it's a hard or soft material, the type of chemical reaction it would have, the atomic weight of it, and so much more stuff. I mean, there's just so much information at a glance on this tool. By design, as we've mentioned, the periodic table was supposed to be a work in progress. So once we've adopted it into science as a standard tool, we needed somebody to kind of manage it, right? That falls to the International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry, or IUPAC. We're going to call them EUPAC. I don't know if that's actually what they would say, but the EUPACs. They revise the periodic table as new data becomes available. When a scientist publishes that they've found a new element, you know, Tony Stark or whatever, they'll end up putting it onto the table where it belongs, and they will, once they've approved and figured it out. At the time we recorded this episode, the most recent version of the periodic table was approved back in February of 2010. So if you pull up a periodic table and you just really look at it, like read the elements, not the common ones like oxygen and carbon and nitrogen and potassium and helium and, you know, all of those. Check out the other little ones that you never look at, like antimony. It's a weird word. It sounds sad. You know, somebody's antimonious. It's a word I just made up. It might mean that you're brittle, and since antimony is commonly used in makeup, it would probably mean that you're covering it up. That sounds real sad. There's also things like krypton, real element. It's in a noble gas family. We've got cyborgium and prasidymium and tantalum, how tantalizing, and selenium, like selenia gomez. I don't know. So who names these things? That's really the point. The scientist who synthesizes the new element is allowed to recommend a permanent name. Once it's approved, the IUPAC can decide whether or not that should be the name. So what happens if two scientists both discover it at about the same time? Well, the IUPAC has had the responsibility of naming elements since 1947 and doesn't, you know, hurry when it comes to figuring this out. They'd rather take their time. So it can take years to verify that an element is going to get a name that you suggested. Until they're verified, the IUPAC recommends scientists use a naming convention when discussing an element. So the associate director of IUPAC, Dr. Fabian Myers, explains the current naming process like this, and this is a quote. Since the sake of naming an element is essentially to avoid confusion, it is important to ensure that the proposed name is unique and has not been used earlier, even unofficially or temporarily, for a different element. So that means because they're scientists and because it's some kind of, you know, overarching bureaucracy, they got to do the most boring element name ever. So they use the digits of the atomic number assigned to a Latin root to name new elements while they're waiting to get the fun name. 
So for element 115, for example, which was discovered by both Russian and American scientists in early 2004, the temporary name is Uninpentium. For 113, it's Unintrium. And the idea there is Un for one, Pent for five, and Eum because it's an element. So they're all Eums. So Uninpentium. Boring. The naming convention was first published in 1990, and the idea was if we're not fighting it out, we can all agree that the element has this name, and then we can all move on while we wait to see what the fun name is going to be. However, there are some disagreements. It's like the nerdiest fights you will ever see, and it always happens in paper. You know, people are writing a paper, and they're writing a letter, and they're like, it should be called this because of this great person that we've decided to name. You know, element 41 was not agreed upon for 150 years because in America we called it columbium, and in Europe they called it niobium. The IUPAC decided officially to name it niobium in 1949, whatever. There's also, though, the transfermium elements, which are super heavy elements with atomic numbers over 100. And for decades, Russians, Americans, and Germans were all fighting out who discovered which elements and when. They were offering different names, and different chemistry groups were using different names for the same element. And, you know, you'd go to a conference and you'd say, oh, tracium is the best element. And they'd say, oh, you mean bradium? And I'd say, no, tracium. And they'd say, no, bradium. And then we'd fight about it, but probably not with fists. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. So element 104 in American labs actually had this happen. It was called Rutherfordium after a New Zealand physicist, Ernest Rutherford. But in Russian labs, it was called Kurchatovium after Soviet physicist Igor Kurchatov. Naming of things is tough, like just across the board. You discover a new bug, you would hope that you get to name it, unless somebody else also discovered that new bug. Recently, they had to go through all of these different discoveries and found out there were a bunch of species that had two different names, but they were the same species. At least in this case, we can look at the atomic numbers the number of protons, and say, oh, we've already got that one. We don't need, you know, don't need that. So it's really good that we have the IUPAC to help us name these things, and it's kind of incredible to watch the nationalism and the pride of these scientists who are discovering these things. But in the end, the periodic table is a tool to help us understand and rationalize and organize the world around us in the nerdiest and most incredible way ever. You know, this old Russian Santa Claus stinky dude came up with this idea in a dream, and we still use it more than 150 years later. That's crazy. And kind of why science is amazing. Because we've added dozens of elements to this template, and it just keeps working for us. It's really stood the test of time. And it seems like it's going to keep doing so. It's evolving as we learn more about the universe, and there's lots of space left. We're not even sure how far this thing goes. That's why science is so incredible. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about human connection here on Test Tube Plus. So make sure you subscribe so you can get that series. And also let us know down in the comments if you have any mind-blowing science stories that you want us to look more into. We've got pretty good researchers here. It'll be pretty fun if we can do one of your episodes as well. So thanks for watching. I'm Trace. Come find me on Twitter if you want to talk. I'm at Trace Dominguez. And we'll see you next time. Test tube plus.